All right, folks at the Wellness Cafe. Today we have Dr. Peter Osborne in the house. Welcome, Doc. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I am well. I'm so excited to have you on today because um, you are the leading experts in the field of nutrition. And we've had um, Dr. Tom O'Brien on before, and he basically just blew it out of the water as well as far as educating people on gluten and grains. And we just want to really kind of get into um, the meat of it today again because I read your book, No Grain, No Pain, and it's a fabulous book, and it's packaged in a way that it's so easy for the lay public to understand. So it's a great read for our audience out there who hasn't um, checked it out. Go ahead to Amazon or uh, our show note and check the book out. So, Doc, for our audience who has no idea who you are, how about you just Tell us a bit about your journey and how did you get into doing functional medicine and doing what you do today? Okay, sure. Yeah, I started. Um, I started in the VA hospital. I was training in uh, in a rheumatology rotation and during graduate school. And so all the people coming through the rotation were very sick. You know, the the, the typical rheumatological diseases: the rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, scleroderma, fibromyalgia, dermatomyositis, on, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, uh, Rider syndrome. So all these different types of basically painful autoimmune conditions. And the <clears throat> the standard of care was um, was horrible because these these people were being put on methotrexate, they were being injected with gold, they were being put on uh, high dose steroids and long term non steroidal anti inflammatories. And most of them were very very unhealthy. The drugs, yeah, they mitigated the pain to a certain extent, but they also created bone loss and joint deterioration. So the very diseases that were being treated were really not being treated, they were being managed. The pain was being managed, mm. but the disease process itself was being completely ignored. And um, when I went to my attending physician and asked if we, if we could pull aside a group of people to do something a little bit different, I, my, my background was in nutrition. And uh, from the literature, from the medical literature, what I was able to, to, to pull in frustration was that if you took people with autoimmune pain and you took away food and you fasted them, then within 48 hours, you're going to see a substantial reduction in pain. Uh, obviously, you can't fast somebody forever. They'll starve to death. But it, it, it begged the question, if you could do a fast for 48 hours and see a reduction in pain, wouldn't you then kind of surmise that maybe it was something that they were eating that was contributing to that level of pain? And so that, that's where my journey began. And then from there, you know, in the autoimmune research, there was one disease we knew, celiac disease, and, and we knew the cause. We already knew what caused it, and it was food. It was gluten. So it made sense to me. Here we have all these other forms of autoimmune disease that are non-responsive to medicines, and the patients are just deteriorating. Um, but when you fast them, they get better. Uh, why wouldn't we at least start by looking at food or at least start by looking at gluten? Because it already was a very, very good model for autoimmune recovery and going gluten-free. But my attending physician wanted wanted to have nothing to do with nutrition. Completely, mm -hmm. uh, completely. Well, let's just say he just said we're not doing that. A lot of the research I brought him, he threw in the garbage. Um, he said we're not, we're just not, we're not interested in this. So it was shortly after I left the VA hospital, one of my very first patients in private practice was a little girl named Ginger. She was terminal. She had she had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. They'd given her six months to live. She had a permanent stent embedded in her arm. And, um, you know, with that, with that, her mom brought her in to see me. And one of the first things I did was, was I looked at her in terms of gluten. So we tested her for gluten sensitivity. She was positive. Now this little girl, I'll tell you how terminal she was. The make a wish foundation granted her wish. Wow. Right. That's how terminal she was. And her favorite food was pizza. So, you know, when we found out she was gluten sensitive, her mom was still in this mindset of she's only got six months to live. I don't want to take away her favorite food. And fortunately, mom had R RA, mom had rheumatoid arthritis. So I was able to get mom to go gluten-free. She felt so much better that we were finally able to convince her to take this little girl uh, gluten-free. And when we did, uh, yeah, obviously the medications became unnecessary. The stent that was embedded in her arm, we were able to get it out. She graduated from high school a few years ago. She's doing great. She has no symptoms. She's in complete remission. So a little girl with a terminal life sentence 
um, was one of my first patients. And I knew at that point that this information had to be, it had to be more mainstream. It had to get into the hands of all the other people that were suffering from autoimmune disease. When, again, when I worked in the VA hospital, you know, I, it was it was the VA hospital. So these are veterans, right? These are veterans that are being treated to me that were being treated wrongly. They were being treated poorly. They were being running. They were being run through a mill that wasn't really effectively treating their disease. And uh, I'm a veteran. I, I have a place in my heart for people that have served their country and sacrificed so much. And I just I knew the information needed to get out to the masses. And so it was at that point that we began the process clinically of, of refining protocols and really getting in patients with chronic and terminal forms of, of, of rheumatological autoimmune diseases. And my success rate was so great. It was so high. I mean, we have a 100% success rate in treatment if the patients are willing to comply. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, you can't, if the patient's not going to comply, they're not going to get, they're not going to get a benefit of going grain-free if they're not going grain-free, right? So, um, but the success rate was 100%. And then from there, we founded what, what uh, our foundation, Gluten-Free Society, uh, glutenfreesociety.org. And so what we did is we wanted to create a platform where people could come and get educated about how gluten can impact autoimmune disease. And that's why I created Gluten-Free Society. And so now that, that website, we get millions of visitors a year, and that, that wasn't enough. I mean, we're getting a lot of people coming to the site and getting educated, but it still wasn't enough. So I created a, a practitioner training program so that doctors could learn more about this information. We created a 10-hour postgraduate program to get the information into the more hands of more doctors because, you know, obviously the more doctors that are out there that are teaching and that are doing, are uh, the more patients we're going to impact. My goal, you know, is to reach 100 million patients. And uh, I can't do that in my clinic. I only take on about 400 new patients a year. So I, I can't do that. I can't reach 100 million on my own, um, nor, would I, nor would I ever a dream or aspire to do that on my own. But I can, I can do it through Gluten-Free Society, and I can do it through training other practitioners and other doctors. And so that's what, what our mission set out to be. So that, that's a little bit about me and, and what I'm doing and what I'm trying to do in the world. Fabulous. And that's why we're here, um, to help you spread your message. So for people out there that are just um, listening right now and for the first time are just stunned because – the paradigm is completely flipped upside down. I mean, for most people, for me personally, I grown up eating grains, pizza and donuts and hamburgers and everything like that. And in my knowledge, we've been eating grains for generations upon generations. Um, why is that so bad? Or is, are we supposed to be eating grains at all? Well, I think there can be an argument for both sides. I think, and I think there's science to support both sides. So I'm not going to say that everyone in the world needs to be grain free in order to to have a good health. But I will say this: let's just take America. Let's just look at the microcosm of the United States, and let's look at the last hundred years, okay? Because that's generations, right? We've got four or five generations within that hundred year span, and let's look at the disease rates. If we go back to 1900. Before cereal was invented, okay, 1895 was when cereal was invented. It was uh, invented by Post and Kellogg. They created grape nuts and they created uh, cornflakes. Um, prior to that time, we didn't have heart disease to the degree that we have it today. Matter of fact, there was not enough heart disease to merit cardiology. There was no such thing as a cardiologist. You didn't need a specialty field to treat heart disease because there wasn't enough of it to treat. So if we look at the introduction of grain in early 1900s, late, late 1800s, um, and we follow the pattern from 1895 to 1943, grain became a staple, became a traditional food, became, okay, cereal, pasta, you know, the different things that people think are staple foods that have been around for thousands of years that really haven't, okay? These processed grains and processed breads and processed pastas and cereals and pizza and donuts and bagels and, you know, you name it. If we look at what happened in 1943, the United States government banned the sale of processed grain, banned it. They said you can no longer sell processed grain. Why? Because it was responsible for causing widespread malnutrition. We look at there's two diseases in particular that were studied, beriberi, which is a disease of vitamin B1 deficiency, and the other is pellagra, which is a deficiency of vitamin B3 deficiency. Well, 8,000 deaths a year from beriberi. 
before the government stepped in and said, no more. What does beriberi cause, by the way? It causes heart disease. Mm. Beriberi causes congestive heart failure. That's one of the one of the signs of beriberi. So here we have, you know, we have neurological and heart disease being caused by nutritional deficiency that was caused by the production of processed grain and adding that to as a staple food to the human diet. And so instead, the government banned the sale, but the government said you can still sell it if you fortify it. So if you add vitamin B1, if you add vitamin B3, if you add these things back to the grain, then you, you are able to sell it and we'll be okay with that. And so instead of saying, the cereal marketers said, instead of saying, hey, don't eat us, we'll kill you, they said, eat more of us because now we're fortified and we're even better for you. So it's a, it was a twist on words. It was a play on marketing. And you know what did they start doing? They started advertising to children. They started creating cartoon characters, Tony the Tiger, you know, the Lucky Charms uh, elf or whatever he is, you know, the little leprechaun guy. Um, you know, you've got all the rabbit, the tricks rabbit. You've got all these cartoon characters that for generations, you know, indoctrinated the minds of young people into believing that eating grain was somehow a necessity to have a balanced breakfast and to have a balanced diet. And so if you follow the trend of disease with the trend of processed grain, you can see heart disease has gone up, cancer has gone up, autoimmune disease has gone up, and exponentially so. So we can we can make an argument that says, yeah, we've been eating these grains for generations, but we can also make an argument saying that since we've been eating these grains for generations, disease rates have gone up dramatically. Now, that's not the only reason disease rates have gone up. Certainly, there are other reasons. Processed sugar is certainly one of those reasons. Chemicals in the environment is certainly one of those reasons. But, you know, we live in a time where knowledge is at our fingertips. We can access the internet, we can get instantaneous information. We should not be living in the dark ages of nutrition. You know, people should have access to this information. And it's not something it's not something that, that really a lot of doctors teach because they don't take nutrition. So you ask a doctor, you ask, ask your average doctor what Barry Berry is, and they're gonna look at you with question marks over their head. You ask the average doctor what Kwashiorkor is, and they're not gonna be able to answer that question. By the way, that's protein malnutrition. So it's because doctors don't study nutrition. And in my opinion, fundamentally, how can you even be a doctor if you don't know basic nutrition, right? That's biochemistry. And but, but patients don't know that. Patients go to the doctor thinking this guy's an expert in his field or this gal, right? This doctor is an expert and they should know about nutrition. So they assume the doctor knows about nutrition. And when the doctor says, oh, it has nothing to do with nutrition, your disease has nothing to do with food, they believe that doctor, but they falsely believe that doctor because they're under the impression that doctor has had an education and he hasn't, right? And so the average medical doctor has less than seven hours of nutritional training. Let me give you a comparative. I've had over 10,000 hours of nutritional training in my career. And, and in graduate school alone, I had over 100. And postgraduate, uh, right after graduating, I had over 300, you know, right out of the gates as a newbie, as a fresh doctor. Now, that's 400 hours that I had where the average doctor gets seven, right? So there's a big discrepancy. There's a big, big uh, dip in what our patients believe doctors should know versus what they actually do know. And that's a big part of why there's this skepticism out there is that you've got a lot of doctors saying, oh, this is a fad. This whole gluten-free thing is, is a myth. So so anyway, I kind of got off tangent. My, my point in starting that whole conversation was to answer your question, which is, you know, why, if we have all these people that have been eating grains for generations, why all of a sudden now is this very, very popular trend and fad, you know, taking the country by storm? It, the reason it is, is because people have reached a threshold where drugs have quit working and they're looking for other answers. And now they have access to information and they have the Internet and they can find that information. So there are droves of people that are fed up with the failure of, of treating chronic autoimmune disease with medicine because it doesn't work. The treatment model has failed. If it worked, we'd have less autoimmune disease, not more. But if you look at the numbers right now as it stands, there are an estimated 46 to 50 million cases of autoimmune disease in the United States alone. And it's more estimated that it's closer to 100 million if you count some of the diseases that we've newly discovered have an autoimmune component. For example, a lot of the heart disease is autoimmune disease. Osteoporosis is a form of autoimmune disease. Doctors aren't talking about that. Patients don't even really realize that. They get a diagnosis, but they don't get, a, they don't get told, hey, this osteoporosis, it's because your immune system is eating your bone away, not because you, you're not getting enough calcium. It's because your immune system is eating your bone away. Patients don't get told this information. So what are the triggers for autoimmune disease? 
Well, the only known scientifically validated 100% agreed upon trigger, if we go back to when I originally discovered uh, what I did in the VA hospital at the time was gluten. Okay, so we know that because there's a disease model that represents it, and that's celiac disease. But, but just because gluten can cause celiac disease doesn't mean that it can't cause other autoimmune diseases, and that's, a, that's an area in the research that's, that's now being researched very, very well. We've now linked hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, to gluten consumption. There have been links in the, in the literature to lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia and neuro neurological diseases like cerebellar ataxia, which is an autoimmune disease that causes dizziness. There are migraine headaches is a form of autoimmune disease that there have been linkages to gluten sensitivity. So now we have an abundance of research that's been done, but it's just not being disseminated in an accurate manner. It's not being disseminated in a widespread manner to the population. And again, that, that goes back to what my mission is, is to let people with autoimmune disease know, look, you have at least one very, very solid thing you can do in your diet today without paying any money to any doctors, without doing anything else, is just simply go grain free. And it is one of the biggest impact factors that you have over your health and over your autoimmune disease. And I have not seen a case where a person went grain free, where they didn't have a, a remarkable impact on their symptoms. Now there are cases where it's grain free is not a catch all, it's not a cure all, but, but I'm saying a remarkable impact. So you take somebody, for example, with chronic migraines, who has chronic migraines, you know, on a weekly basis, and you take them grain free, and now they only have a migraine once every two months, right? That's a profound change on their life. That's a profound impact on their health and I think it I think it's worth saying and I think it's worth teaching if we can give people the power to change their diet they don't require the medicines they don't even require the physician follow-up uh, and now they're educated and now they can make decisions and they can make informed decisions about their health uh, and I think that's I think that's a big move in the right direction is just letting them know that diet plays a role in their disease definitely and it's all about empowering the patient that they have a choice and they have the say in how their health is going to progress, whether it's going to get worse, whether it's going to get better. And what you were saying was right on because I was reading somewhere that um, it takes about 17 years for the, the researchers findings to catch up in the medical doctors or in doctor's office and actually get implemented into protocols and whatnot. I want to take you back to um, the point that you were saying that grains was causing nutritional deficiencies. Can you explain to our listeners how is that so? So let's, let's be clear. Processed grain is stripped away. The reason they process the grain is because if you try to eat the grain without processing it, it causes digestive disruption. Understand what grain is. Grain is a seed. At its, its fundamental core, it's a seed. And so seeds are designed to do what? If we look at just basic biology, what is the design of a seed? It's designed to perpetuate its own species, right? Only seeds are not animate objects. They can't run away. They can't run from predators. How do they protect themselves? Well, one of the ways seeds protect themselves from predators is they have a hard outer shell, right? It's hard outer coating. It's hard for our digestive enzymes to get through that, right? We can chew that. We can chew that. If you've ever been out in a grain field and tried to pick up the grain and chew it, it's very hard. It cuts the roof of your mouth. It's very hard to penetrate. It can give you stomach upset. One of the reasons why is the seed is releasing chemicals that help inhibit your digestion. Okay, so seeds have the ability to wage chemical warfare against predators. People don't realize that. They haven't been taught that. Um, so that's one aspect. But when we, when we process the seed, meaning we strip out the outer hole so that our digestive tract can get to it easier, we're not stripping away those chemicals. Mm. We're not stripping away... Those, there's some chemicals, one type of chemical called an ATI, amylase trypsin inhibitor. And what it does, it's been shown to do a few different things. One, it shuts down the pancreas. Okay, so it, it, it turns your pancreas off. Your pancreas is supposed to secrete digestive enzymes into your small intestine so that you can digest the food. But if you're eating a food as a staple that's shutting your pancreas down, then what's, what's going to happen to that food when you eat it? It's going to rot right inside of your intestine. It's going to putrefy. And it's going to feed yeast. And it's going to ferment. And when you ferment grains what happens we create wine right when we ferment uh when we for well we can create wine we can create hard liquor what would you like if we want to ferment some wheat we can create some beer so what happens to a lot of people is they get you know they get they, they get what's called wheat belly and dr william davis spoke about about this in some of his 
and some of his literature and some of the context of what he writes about with, with wheat and heart disease is that the reason that wheat belly, the big bulbous belly, occurs is because you're fermenting this rotted food because mm. you can't digest it, and it's turning into alcohol. And what happens is you get a beer belly, right? That's what it is. You get a beer belly because you're, you're producing alcohol, and alcohol is highly caloric, right? It's seven calories per gram versus a, a carbohydrate, which is four calories per gram. So, you know, that's one of the aspects of the seed is they, they have a chemical called an ATI that causes the shutdown of your pancreas, but also causes this ATI can also trigger uh, inflammation within the GI tract itself. It triggers an inflammatory response through what's called, this is a little techie, but it, there's, a, there's a receptor in our gut lining called a toll-like receptor. And ATIs bind to this receptor and, and, and they cause an immune response with it. And it causes our gut basically to become inflamed. Now, now that's not even gluten. We're not even talking about the gluten yet, right? I mean, that's just one family of proteins found within grains that we know has a remarkable effect on the pancreas and, and, and in creating inflammatory disease in the gut. Now, let's talk about other properties of grain beyond gluten. Because gluten, I, I don't know, I mean, if you talked with Tom O'Brien, you probably talked about gluten. So let's, let's give your audience something that maybe they've never heard that they need to understand, right? So one of the other things common in grain is there is a heavy, heavy quantity of mycotoxins. Mycotoxins are mold toxins. The way grain is grown in our country, it's stored in big bins. And where it's stored, mold starts to proliferate. Mold starts to grow. And mold releases a chemical byproduct called a mycotoxin, M-Y-C-O toxin, mycotoxin. And you can look this up. It's, it, there are different kinds of mycotoxins in grain. But where we see the most mycotoxins in our food is in grains, specifically in gluten-free foods. The, the, the ones that are corn-based or rice-based, very heavy mycotoxins. There's different kinds of toxins called okra toxins and aflatoxins that are commonly found. And there's no limit in the United States. In other words, the U.S. doesn't monitor these mold toxins within the food. They do it in Europe. They monitor the quantity that's allowed in, in the food. But in wow. the United States, they don't allow that. So a lot of people, they're eating this grain. They're getting these, these proteins that shut down their pancreas. Right. So now they're fermenting the grain, but now they're also getting exposure to all these mold toxins, which are disruptive to the gut, but can also cause hormone imbalance. OK, so that's another aspect. OK, then you have the component about grain when you're processing the grain. It's very, very highly glycemic. Hmm. So it's it causes an insulin spike. OK, and that that what that means, it's just like eating sugar, probably worse. As a matter of fact, there's a there's a, a component to wheat called uh, amylopectin, which is more glycemic than cane sugar. So it actually causes blood sugar spikes that are greater than if you were to eat a spoonful of sugar. So eat your Wheaties and it's causing your sugars to spike greater than if you were to eat a, a spoonful of sugar, right? And people don't realize that because you got Olympic athletes on the box of Wheaties because they're being paid millions of dollars to be on that box, not because they actually eat the cereal, right? But <clears throat> it's marketing. So you've got you've got the glycose or the or the glycogen or the glucose effect of eating high levels of grain, which causes an insulin spike, which leads to a cortisol output, which leads to muscle atrophy. Cortisol is a catabolic hormone. So if we're eating foods that chronically cause inflammation, uh, we make cortisol in response to that chronic inflammation. And remember, what does cortisol do? It causes weight gain. It causes muscle loss. It causes water retention. That's why any if you you've probably seen this in your patients if they've ever come to you and they've been injected with steroids what's the first thing that happens is they swell up right all that water retention and then they get fat they start they put on 20 30 pounds in a year because they've they've been overexposed to steroids it's because steroids cause muscle loss and when you reduce muscle mass you lower metabolism and they could be eating the same amount of calories every day but when their metabolism is lowered because they don't have as much muscle mass they gain weight anyway so you get this, I call it the grain muscle wasting cycle, mm. where this heavy level of grain, it increases inflammation through ATIs, it increases inflammation through mold toxins, it increases inflammation through gluten, it, it increases inflammation through high levels of sugar, triggering a cortisol response that leads to muscle loss, that then subsequently leads to weight gain, that then subsequently leads to inactivity. Because when a person loses muscle, you know, their muscle shrinks, they, they start to hurt right? Their joints compress. They, they, they don't exercise as much. It hurts to exercise. They're chronically inflamed. So now they become sedentary. 
So now they've lost the ability to really want to exercise or really to exercise because exercise creates more pain and they get stuck in this vicious cycle. And, and then once they're in that cycle, unless somebody educates them about what's going on, what happens? They go to the internet and they say, how do I lose weight? Well, eat whole grain, eat fiber, right? right. And so they start eating more of grain and they eat more of it. And then they're like, why am I not losing weight? I don't understand. I'm eating all this fiber. I'm doing all the right things, but my weight's not coming down and, and my inflammation isn't going away and my joints and my muscles hurt all the time. And then they start developing hormone problems. You know, and hormone problems. So if you look at gluten, one of the one of the problems with gluten is that it triggers a response where it it it, it basically triggers a response where it confuses your immune system to attack your thyroid gland. Now, the thyroid hormone is the master metabolic regulator, right? So if your thyroid, if you become hypothyroid, meaning your thyroid hormone goes down, now your metabolism slows down even more. So you've already lost muscle, and that's lowered your metabolism. Now your thyroid's being affected, and that lowers your metabolism. Right? Where does it end? Where does the cycle end? It doesn't. It ends if the person gets educated. It ends if the person breaks the cycle. And to break that cycle, look, we've got to do everything in an opposite way that that person has been taught. They've been taught, you know, eight, five to ten servings of whole grain a day is the best way to be healthy, and and that's what they're doing. And they're very, very unhealthy. And they keep trying to do it, and they think they're doing the right thing because that's what doctors are trained to. The doctors are saying, yeah, eat your whole grain, and the nutritionists are saying, yeah, eat your whole grain because none of these people read their own literature. None of them read their own research. They don't read their own science. I mean, most of what I know about nutrition comes directly from the medical literature. It comes from <laughs> you know major medical journals. It's not – I didn't create this stuff, so I'm not a, I'm not a research scientist. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm a clinician. So in my practice, you know, I do do some research. We have a lot of data that we've collected over years and we've crunched numbers and crunched the data. And, and I've got some uh, some very, very unique data and very, very unique information. But I am not a research scientist. Uh, so I don't I don't get my ideas strictly from my experiences in my clinic. I also get it from the medical literature. Right. New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, Journal of American Medical Association, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, British Journal of Nutrition, British Journal of Medicine. There's all these wonderful, wonderful uh, research sources that doctors just don't read, right? And they and so what they're the, the common thing that you hear is there's no research to support that. And I'm like, well, what magazines, what journals have you been reading? Because I can pull about ten thousand articles right now on gluten induced disease. And it's very well referenced and it's very well researched. So that tells me to believe that either you don't know what you're talking about um, or you haven't read the literature. And so you're speaking from a point of, of misinformation, which is which is detrimental to my patients. You know, it's one thing to, to say, I don't know. Let me refer you to an expert. It's another thing to say nutrition has nothing to do with that. Right. And so when a doctor says nutrition has nothing to do with that. And, they, and they're not referring them to a, their patient to somebody who's an expert in the field, that's where, to me, that's where malpractice, that's where it sets in. It's not that the doctors that are doing medicine that aren't trained in nutrition aren't doing nutrition. They, they're not trained to do nutrition, but they shouldn't be espousing that nutrition has nothing to do with health because they don't know any better because they haven't been trained adequately to be able to stand on their pedestal and make that statement. If that makes sense. Mm, yeah. So, but, but patients look at doctors as, again, going back to what I said earlier, they look at doctors as kind of the guru, right? The, the expert in the field. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's like this. You wouldn't hire a plumber to put a new roof on your house, mm -hmm. right? Well, you wouldn't want to hire a medical doctor to talk about healthy nutrition because they're not trained in it. And, and it's just time for the public to understand that because I think if they understand that, then at least they'll have another option or at least they'll have another an, another an, another ability to go find additional information without just shutting down nutrition altogether. Definitely, definitely. And you mentioned in the book the concept of gluten-free whiplash, where people start off by going gluten-free, but they're now shopping in gluten-free aisle. And what happens to that person after a while? They get more pain. Can you explain to our audience why is that? So gluten-free whiplash is, is – so un, let's understand that – First, I think to understand gluten-free whiplash, we got to understand how the FDA defines gluten. The FDA defines gluten as a protein called alpha-gliadin, G-L-I-A-D-I-N. Alpha-gliadin is the name of one type of gluten found in wheat, barley, and rye. 
So when you're looking at a food label and it says gluten-free, it doesn't mean gluten-free. It means alpha-gliadin-free. That's just mm. the way the FDA defines it. Now, there are over a thousand forms of gluten. Alpha-gliadin is one of over a thousand forms. Uh, in 2010, a researcher in Australia found 400 new forms of gluten. 40 of them were more toxic than alpha-gliadin. So wow. people don't realize this, and a lot of doctors don't, don't even realize this. My, my point in saying that is that it's simple. If you go gluten-free by the traditional definition that the FDA defines gluten as, you're only really going wheat, barley, and rye-free. Okay, so these people, they, they cut out wheat, they cut out barley, they cut out rye, which, yes, there's a lot of gluten in those three grains. And so what do they do instead? They, they go buy to the gluten-free aisle on the grocery store, and they're buying corn and rice and gluten-free oats. With, but they're not realizing that these grains also contain forms of gluten. They, they do. It's just not alpha-gliadin. It's a different form of gluten. And so these people are reacting to these different forms of gluten. And so what happens is initially is they go gluten-free, right? They cut out wheat, barley, rye. They don't know about the gluten-free food aisle. So they're really not eating a lot of grain and their health improves, right? But then they discover the gluten-free food aisle and they discover <laughs> rice bread and corn cereals and all these other products. And they start eating them and start making them a staple in the diet. And then they start, their health starts to deteriorate again. That's the whiplash is because they have rediscovered gluten in a different form. So they've gone gluten-free, but only gluten-free in the sense of the way the FDA defines it. But they've started eating gluten again in the sense that all grains contain a form of gluten. Okay, All grains contain gluten, period. There's no arguing that. Gluten is defined as the family of proteins found within the seeds of grass. Well, the seeds of grass are grains. Corn is a grain. Rice is a grain. Sorghum is a grain. Oat is a grain. Right? They all have glutens. They just have different kinds of glutens, and that's what people don't understand. And so when they go to the gluten-free aisle, all those food packages say gluten-free, but they still have forms of gluten that cause inflammation and that can cause health issues. So again, that whiplash is when they discover that, they start eating those foods, and their health starts to deteriorate again, and then they're, they're wondering why the gluten-free diet isn't working anymore. And then they quit. And if they hopefully, they'll find somebody like me or one of my trained physicians – who are out there um, so that they don't quit, so that they just get redirected back on the right track, right? One of the reasons the paleo diet is so popular is because it's grain-free, right? Grain-free means gluten-free in the truest sense of the word because all grains contain some form of gluten. So the only way you can truly be gluten-free is to, is to be grain-free, meaning no rice, no corn, no oat. Now, I know maybe a lot of your audience is saying, holy cow, what am I going to eat? Um, that's, that's generally the response that we hear. You're going to eat vegetables. You're going to eat meat. You're going to eat nuts. You're going to eat healthy food. And most people don't realize that their diets are very, very limited. They're eating grain at every meal. So like it's just grain in a different form. You know, it's compressed in a cereal bar. Or it's made in this shape or it's made in that shape, but it's a cereal. It's a pasta. It's a loaf of bread. It's a type of bread. It's, you know, it's some type of grain based product. So they're really only eating one thing, right? They're, you know, or maybe a few things like corn products or rice products or wheat products, but they're only really eating three or four different kinds of foods. They're, there's not really any diversity within their diet. There's sameness because they're primarily just eating grain. But when you open the field up to meats and vegetables and fruits, there's three, 400 different varieties locally grown in the United States alone of different vegetables and fruits and meats. So you actually expand your diet to a much greater sense. You expand the diversity of your diet. And one of the things that we do know is a diverse diet does make for healthier humans. Um, no matter what you're talking about, no matter what science you read, when there's a diversity in the diet, meaning, and, and what I, let me define diversity. Picking foods that are seasonally available is the best way to be diverse because in the summer when blueberries are growing, you eat them while they're growing, but in the winter, they're not growing, right? So then you move on to the winter squashes. You move on to some of the other foods that grow really hardy, hardy in the winter. So you have diversity in your diet based on seasonal variation and seasonal availability of the different forms of foods as they grow. And that, that in and of itself keeps humans hardy, keeps them healthy, keeps them from developing leaky gut, keeps them from developing food allergies. Definitely. And not only that, when you eat seasonally, it tastes better. Because you Amen. get yeah. you get the stuff from the farmer's market. You get what's growing in season instead of some bananas that comes 5,000 miles away and has been ripened in the truck to get to you. So it's definitely going to be tasting a lot better. Yep, for sure. 
Doc, I want to touch on this concept that you elaborate pretty well in the book, which is the prescription pain trap. Can you explain to our audience briefly what does that mean? Why pain pills is giving me more pain? Yeah. So here's what happens: if if the pain that a person is experiencing is from trauma, like a sprained ankle or um, some form of injury. This isn't what I'm referring to. So I want to be clear. It's not for acute pain that I'm talking about. It's chronic pain. People with autoimmune pain, for example, um, chronic arthritis, right? Um, There's no trauma. It's just that my joints hurt all the time. I wake up stiff every day. My muscles hurt all the time. That kind of pain, that chronic pain. These people get put on, you know, steroids. They get put on non steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or Celebrex or Mobic, Right. And, and what happens is, one, they're masking the pain temporarily, right? They're, they're, they're hiding the pain. They're hiding the reason the pain exists. That's what the drug does. It hides the pain. It doesn't address why the pain is there. And, and when you give a person a drug to hide the symptom, you're actually shutting down the body's warning system for that person to be smart enough to make a change. Because if there's a pain, their body is telling them, hey, do something different, right? So if we mask that, we're masking the ability for that person to go back and figure that piece out. That's one of the problems. But the bigger problem is that the long term, we start getting into pain medications, you know, where chronic pain management, let's look at like drugs, like, like narcotics, like uh, oxycodone, right? Some of these, some of these heavier hitters. Um, These medications cause addiction. Yes. But the risk of death is very high. Mm. Um, These drugs are responsible for, I think at last count, it was uh, upwards of over 20,000 deaths a year from the proper use of these drugs, not from like accidental overdose, not from, uh, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm on the streets dealing this drug illegally. This is the proper use. We get that many deaths. As a matter of fact, the director of the CDC, Thomas Fre- uh, Friesen, or Friedman, um, he came out and said earlier in 2016, he said, um, we know of no other class of drug so readily prescribed that does so much damage to their patients and, and actually causes the, such a huge risk of death. And, and they made a huge, they put out a huge warning on these types of medications, meaning that, you know, we need to really redesign how they're being prescribed. And, you know, it's one thing if you've got acute injury. It's another thing if you're a chronic cancer patient just suffering tremendously. We're not talking about that. We're talking about chronic pain, chronic pain management. Um, but then the other, the other aspect of, of pain management is the non steroidal anti inflammatories. So, so these are, again, ibuprofen, aspirin. Uh, Celebrex, Mobic, um, Naproxen, very, very common drugs, some of them over the counter, some of them prescription, but they cause, uh, they cause gastric erosion and small intestinal erosion. So think of your, your stomach and your intestines have a lining and that lining is designed to protect you from things in your diet that could be potentially harmful Uh, because when we eat, we eat bad things as well as good, right? And so that lining is there as a buffer. It's there as a protection. But these drugs erode that lining, okay, and they contribute to something called intestinal permeability or leaky gut. Okay, so now what happens, even doses of aspirin, baby aspirin, in doses as low as 7.5 milligrams can cause gastric erosion and bleeding. Wow. That's like one-twelfth of a baby aspirin. That's the one-twelfth of a dose of a baby aspirin. If you noticed, last year they came out and said, we're not so sure about this whole aspirin cardiovascular thing. We're going to start backing off on that advice. I don't know if you saw that or not. It was in the, it was a couple of studies that came out. And now they're starting to reverse their position on aspirin. So part of the reason why is it causes gastric bleeding. It causes occult bleeding within the within the intestines. So the people develop anemias because they have occult bleeding. Now, what does iron deficiency cause? When you have occult bleeding and you have iron deficiency, it causes pain because you need iron to carry oxygen. So when your muscles are not getting adequate oxygen, they go into what's called anaerobic metabolism. They don't have enough oxygen to make energy. What it's so think about like lifting weights. If I'm lifting weights, I'm going to get to a point where I'm, I'm out of oxygen and my muscle starts to burn, right? That lactic acid burn, right? But imagine you don't, you have an iron deficiency that's bad enough that causes your muscles to always burn. Oh, wow. Okay. And so then we have chronic muscle pain. It's a very common side effect of iron deficiency. These drugs cause iron deficiency. That's one of the problems with them. So they actually set the stage for chronic anaerobic metabolism in the muscles that leads to chronic lactic acid production, 
fatigue, shortness of breath, and muscle pain. And when the muscles don't get enough oxygen, they also shorten, they atrophy. So now we get greater joint compression. So, you know, again, now, now we're talking about pain, right? So we're talking about, okay, here I'm taking this drug six months, it's caused an iron deficiency, now my muscles hurt even more, but they hurt for a different reason. Mm. So now what do the doctors do? They give a different kind of pain medication. Okay, so now let's come in and let's say, okay, we're gonna give you like a Lyrica, which is one of the, or, or Gabapentin, which is one of these that tries to affect the nerves and, and, and it affects the nerves and how, the pain, how we register pain through our nerves. These drugs shut down the gut, so now they're causing constipation. So now we're, you know, the patient who's, you know, just trying to get out of pain, now they're taking a drug and it just totally shuts their gut down. And so now they have a leaky gut, they have a gut that shut down, so the gut's leaking, but the food isn't moving through it very well because of the constipation. So now that food, it's rotting, it's putrefying in the gut, and the chemicals and the, and the, and the damage is leaking into the bloodstream, and it's going systemic all over the body, right? And so now we have all this stuff leaking through, creating immune responses. And so we get, there's a process in autoimmune disease called molecular mimicry, where we're getting all these chemicals leaching through into the bloodstream that look like our own tissues. Our immune system starts to attack them, but then our immune system says, hey, these chemicals that we're attacking look like your joints. So now that the immune system gets confused and it starts attacking your joints and we end up with a severe cycle of autoimmune pain. So, so again, we got to go back to where do we start? We start with looking for the origin of why the pain is there in the first place, right? So depending on the diagnosis, there's a lot of pain-based diseases. There's, you know, there's all the different forms of autoimmune, autoimmune arthritis, like rheumatoid and lupus and psoriatic arthritis and spondyloarthritis. So there's this whole family, reactive arthritis, right? So those are forms of pain. But then you have, you have other forms of pain. You have just people who have generalized myalgia, like fibromyalgia, right? And they don't know why, um, but they're just being medicated. You've got to go backwards and you've got to start figuring the whys out. There are four fundamental whys to pain. There are four fundamental reasons why people become or develop pain. And, and I want your audience to understand these four reasons because if they understand them, then they can seek out, uh, seek out better help, right? Reason number one is they're eating the wrong food. If they're eating food that causes inflammation, understand inflammation always leads to pain. So, so identifying what foods are creating inflammation is a first big step. For most people, gluten is one of the most famous, but there are certainly are. I've had people who are allergic to blueberries. I've had people who are allergic to broccoli, right? Healthy food, but for those individuals, you know, one man's food is another man's poison. So healthy food, but not healthy for, for some. So we test. We always test. What is a person going to react to? What is a person going to have uh, an immune response to? Because everyone's unique and everyone's different. So looking at food, food is number one. Number two, environmental toxins. And so this, this is food preservatives, this is food additives, this is mold toxins found in grain, this is heavy metals found in the environment, this is pesticides found in the environment, this is petro-based, excuse me, petro-based chemicals found in cosmetics or, you know, or found in the drinking water or whatever. So, you know, we put filters in place to filter the air, to filter the water. We, we find out what they're rubbing on their body, what they're putting on their body in terms of chemicals, right? We try to we try to peel back the layers of chemical exposure. And I do a test that actually measures what chemicals we should be focusing on. So if they're, for example, if they have high levels of lead, which a lot of people over the age of 50 do because they grew up in an age where gasoline had lead in it and paint had lead in it and children's toys were commonly painted with lead-based paints. So, so we have this generation of what we call the leaded generation, right? And then we have you know, this generation coming up with lots of mercury in their teeth, silver amalgams, or they're being injected with vaccines that contain high levels of mercury, or, or the fish, the contaminated fish that they're eating that has high levels of mercury. So we've got, you know, those are different kinds of chemicals that we want to know about. We want to rule those things out so that we could say, okay, look, it's a problem for you, and here's the solution to dealing with that excess of lead or that excess of mercury or cadmium or arsenic or aluminum or cadmium or antimony or thallium or whatever the heavy metal is, right? We test those things. So again, food, chemicals, <coughs> excuse me. Then we're going to look at the third trigger, which is infections, okay? And, and so let me be clear about infection. A lot of people think of an infection like a cold or a flu, and they say, oh, I got a great immune system. I never get sick. It's not what I'm talking about. There's acute infection and there's chronic infection. For most people, acute infection is easy to recognize. It is the cold or the flu. But for some people, let me give you an example. You've heard of Helicobacter pylori, H. pylori, right? 
Yes. H. pylori yes. won, it won a Nobel Prize. It's a bacteria. It won a Nobel Prize in medicine because when it was discovered, uh, it was uh, it was discovered to cause ulcers. It was discovered to cause stomach ulcers. It didn't cause a fever, right? It didn't cause some major what we would consider to be an infection in terms of symptoms. It didn't cause general malaise and fatigue and low-grade fever. It caused ulcers, right? So that's an example of a chronic infection. There are, are lots of different forms of chronic bacterial or mold infections that people can get exposure to. For example, in autoimmune arthritis, very, very common to see Klebsiella, which is a type of bacteria. Very common to see Pseudomonas, especially Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a very common type of bacteria. Very common to see Lyme or, mm. or, or Borrelia, right, which is a very, very common type of bacterial infection, but it doesn't present with a fever. It doesn't present with vomiting or diarrhea, what we would classically consider to be an infection. So you got to rule out these latent, what are sometimes referred to as stealth infections, because stealth infections, sometimes the only way that they manifest is pain. They manifest as muscle pain or they manifest as, as, as joint pain, and they don't manifest in any other way. So we want to rule these things out. We want to rule these kinds of infections out. So again, we're going back again, food, chemicals, stealth infections. And then the fourth trigger is inadequate nutrition or nutritional deficit. The most well-studied cause of autoimmunity in terms of nutritional deficit is vitamin D deficiency. Mm. We know vitamin D deficiency is a major, major trigger for diseases like diabetes, type 1 diabetes, and for rheumatoid arthritis. We know that, uh, that you cannot properly activate thyroid hormone without vitamin D. So we see vitamin D deficiency very, very commonly in Hashimoto's disease. So, so we have to, and vitamin D is an example, but there, there, you know, there are 40 essential nutrients, vitamins and minerals. And so measuring them becomes important, right? Because if a person has a zinc deficiency, they can develop autoimmune disease. If a person has a vitamin C deficiency, they can develop an autoimmune disease. And a multivitamin won't cut it for a lot of people. You, you, some people say, well, I take a multivitamin, there's no way I have a deficiency. Well, understand most multivitamins are garbage. Uh, so like if you're looking at one of these one-a-day type products over the counter, most of those are garbage. They're what we call porta potty vitamins. They, they're, they're so lacquered and encoded, um, they don't even get digested properly, so they come out whole on the other end. So there's no real benefit to using them. Uh, but the other issue is that most of them don't have meaningful doses. You know, they have such marginal dose of vitamin or mineral that if a person's deficient, It'll never, it's like spitting on a forest fire. It's not enough fluid mm -hmm. to put the fire out, right? So, so when it comes to nutritional deficiencies, they need to be adequately tested and adequately measured. You can't measure them in the serum. A lot of doctors will measure like serum B12, right? Or they'll measure serum calcium. It's, oh, you're not nutritionally deficient at all. That You can't accurately assess vitamin and mineral deficiency in the serum because the serum changes based on your last meal, right? It, it ebbs and flows from day to day. If a person didn't eat, breakfast and then they go get their blood drawn you, you know you can get you can get artificial ups and downs in the serum you have to test the cell you have to look inside the cell that's where vitamins work that's where minerals work most of them don't work in the serum they work inside the cell they're intracellular if you will that's where they do their job so if you're not looking inside the cell then you don't really know whether or not a person is getting enough of a nutrient from their mouth to their bloodstream into the cell, right? It has to go from one to the next to the next. If they're get, going from the mouth to the bloodstream, it doesn't mean that they're getting it in the cell. Does that make sense? So we've got a test in the cell. So nutritional deficiencies being that very, very big, important fourth trigger. We could add a fifth trigger, but it, this in this fifth trigger, and it's very common. It's in the fifth trigger is emotion. It's it's wow. a, you know it's it's psych it's psychology. Hmm. In my experience, you know, most people that come to see me. That, so again, this I'm speaking from my experience. They don't have an emotional problem. They're, they're frustrated and, and so emotionally they're distraught, but they're frustrated because they've had a lack of good doctors. They've had a lack of doctors actually helping them find the solution to their problem. So they're not emotionally in this bad place. They're just so frustrated and they're depressed because they can't get a doctor to listen. But the disease itself is not being caused by their depression, if that makes sense. Now, there are some people that are depressed. There are some people with some major psychological trauma, right, that, that this can be a trigger as well. Take, for example, a person who's involved in an abusive relationship, right? It's going to be very, very hard as long as that person's in an abusive relationship to escape disease as long as they're being, you know, they're being poisoned slowly by that relationship. In an abusive relationship, that could be physical abuse. It could be mental abuse. 
you know, there are all kinds of different forms of abuse. But psychologically speaking, uh, you know, having the wrong environment, emotional environment can also be a trigger. It's just in my experience, it's less common uh, a factor. The bigger factor is that they're frustrated because they can't get better. They're not sick because uh, because they have an emotional issue. They're, they're, they have an emotional issue because they can't find a doctor that's going to spend the time and the patience to help them get better. Does that make sense? Definitely. Wow, such a wealth of knowledge today, Dr. Osborne. You provide so much value for our listeners today. I mean, I think we can just keep going on and on and on and we'll just do three, four hours of this, but unfortunately, <laughs> we've got to wrap this thing up. Where can people find you and learn more about you? couple different places. If they want to know more about grains and gluten, I have a foundation called glutenfreesociety.org. And uh, and that website is, is, a, is a public service website. What we do is we try to put resources together for people who are just trying to figure out how to navigate the gluten-free diet correctly. Because there's so many, so many websites that have misinformation about what gluten actually is. We're trying to, to have a resource where they can navigate that correctly. Um, if they want to learn more about my clinic, it's uh, drpeterosborne.com, drpeterosborne, O-S-B-O-R-N-E.com. Um, they can learn more about what we do and the kinds of, kinds of things that we do at our, at our office. And if they want to get ha- their hands on my book, uh, they, can, they can go to any major bookstore across the country. Uh, it's actually in, in seven different languages as well. Um, you know, so they can pick that up, Barnes & Noble. They can pick that up at, uh, at Amazon. Or they can go if they want to pick it up and they want to get some bonuses when they pick it up, like some extra resources. I really encourage them to use nograinnopainbook.com, uh, where if they if they go and buy, we have a 63-page leaky gut manual and a two-hour video tutorial to kind of help guide them through some of the book. It's, so it's just like an extra bonus that it's kind of a it's kind of a a, a bonus to help them navigate the book better so they can get healthier quicker. Thank you so much. And for our listeners, we're going to put all that up in the show notes. So if you check it out at thewellness.cafe and we'll link all that in there. Doc, thanks again for your time. The show is called The Wellness Cafe. If I offer the term wellness to you, what comes up? When I think of wellness, I think of not the absence of disease, but the resiliency around disease. So if we think about what does it truly mean to be well? Most people walk around and they're in this place of what we would call functional illness, meaning they can get up, they can go to work, they can make their dinner, they can they can function, but there's an illness, right? Whether that illness is, you know, and it depends on how they define in their own mind illness, whether that illness is a gut problem or headaches or fatigue all the time or whether it's some known disease. When we think of wellness, we want to think of resiliency and adaptability, meaning that a person should be able to go through life feeling well, feeling good, feeling strong, feeling mobile, um, and not just drudging through life with the excuse of, okay, I can't wait for tomorrow. So I think of resiliency, you know, being able to adapt to the environment in a manner that's consistent with good health, and that good health physically, good health mentally, good health emotionally, good health spiritually, good health chemically. Chemically meaning what we eat, what we put in our mouths, what we put in our bodies. Thank you. You're welcome.